Modeling, in a slightly simplified manner, is the art of finding the right parameters to solve a particular problem. Give me a few parameters, and I'll be able to relate house prices to location and area. Give me a few dozens of parameters, and I may make some crude predictions about their economy. Give me a few hundred of them, and I can start calculating flood risk based on rainfall. But the really amazing stuff and the cool applications start at a few million parameters, because that's when, in combination with neural networks, I can start recognizing cat pictures. And while that is arguably a highlight in human history and an achievement in itself, we didn't stop over there. We have gone above and beyond. ChatGPT3 had 175 billion parameters. At that point, the data set is large enough to contain parameter combinations that were not trained for. We call it emergent behavior. The model is doing things we did not expect it to do. Now imagine that ChatGPT4 has just under 2 trillion parameters. It's a number so mind-bogglingly big, it might as well be meaningless. At this point in time, we are not sure whether adding more parameters is going to meaningfully improve these models, and not in a way that's going to overcome the costs. But that's not even important, because right now, today, and going into the future, Amazon Bedrock and comparable tools are democratizing access to these large language models and giving builders of all kinds direct access. I am pretty sure one of you here is going to use Bedrock to generate Python code that's going to call new large language models which will use other data sources. And in that way, you'll probably stumble upon general intelligence and create the Terminator. I'm not afraid of that future. It's not going to be a talk like that. But I do think that as developers and as data scientists, as people of all kinds, we have a responsibility for the software that we put into this world. And we have a responsibility to make sure that our software does good. And to do that, we need to understand. And there is no better place to start understanding the present than by looking into the past. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today. So my name is Ilya, and I'm a staff engineer at WeTransfer. In that way, I'm firmly a software engineer. I'm not a data scientist or a modeler, per se. But from way before this career was even a possibility for me, I graduated as a civil engineer in Riverend Models. I loved it to bits, data science, modeling. And obviously, I didn't stop doing that. I continued. And at some point, machine learning came to be and became popular. And all my efforts into it eventually bore fruit, and I published applied research. And it was specifically at that point in time that I understood that my experience with the old models is not obsolete. It's still as relevant as it was yesterday, as it is today, and can be useful. And I'm happy to share some of those insights with you. So what is it that we'll be doing? We're going to first define what I mean by classical modeling. It's not a ubiquitous term. I use it for convenience here. And then we'll take a look at what kind of trade-offs we made when modeling in that time. But more importantly than that, we're going to see how those trade-offs relate to today and in what way they might be useful to contextualize or even build modern models. So let's start at the beginning. We're going to define classical modeling. And the easiest way to do this is by listing all the different models that we've used and pointing. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So a very quick recap of history. You have analytical models. Some of you might recognize this as the ideal gas law that relates pressure and volume to temperature. You don't need to understand it. Point is, if you want to know one of these factors, fill out the rest, leave one unknown, and you'll know the value. It's instantaneous, and that's what defines these analytical models. But at some point, things get complex and complicated, and this no longer cuts it. And then you get into numerical modeling. For example, if you have a steel pipe and you heat it from one side and you cool it from the other and you want to calculate how the heat is transported, the way you do this is you cut it up into small little bits and pieces and you calculate every little bit separately. And that's what defines numerical modeling. Statistical modeling talks about probabilities and chance. And all of you are familiar with statistical modeling, even if you have never modeled statistically, 
because machine learning is in a way a superset of that. It's bigger, there's more, they are different, but they share a lot of common ground. And in that way, it's weird that with machine learning, we have defined all these new terms, but almost everything existed already in the classical modeling realm. It just was called a different thing. And then we started supersizing machine learning models, and we ended up with large language models. So this is a little bit simplistic and simplified, so bear with me. But let's take a look at what we mean by classical modeling. When I talk about classical modeling, I mean the first three, the pre-machine learning era types of models that we used. And because my experience is firmly in the numerical side of things, that's what we'll be looking at today. All of you good so far? Awesome. So let's take a look at an example of numerical modeling. And it starts with, well, not with a model, it starts with reality. What is it that you want to do? How does it behave? In this particular example, I've taken a river, and the goal might be to calculate the water levels. The goal might be to look at the sediment transportation. What is it that you are attempting to do is crucial, and you need to define it up front. You also need to define how you're going to measure success. And by defining that and analyzing reality, you can arrive through analysis at a conceptual model. And there are many conceptual models. All of them will be deficient because it's a simplification of reality. I might model in three dimensions, in two. Or in this particular case, I went for a one-dimensional model, which models the river as a line. This has consequences. But at this point, you're aware of them. And then the next step is not something we often do. It's programming that model. To most of us, it's just a library. You might pick a model or code from the internet and apply it. We don't do this ourselves. But what we do ourselves, though, is we calibrate that model to make it match reality. And that's when you end up with a usable model. That usable model can then be used, let me, yeah can then be used to simulate said reality. And you might arrive at the conclusion that it's not good enough. And then you start all over again. And you, if you look at this, you don't even need to squint your eyes. This is exactly the same as with machine learning, albeit from a distance, but it's the same process we follow. And that's exactly why it's interesting to take a look at the past and how we've done this before. So let's talk trade-offs and what kind of trade-offs we made in the past to create these models and to use them. And I understand that I cannot summarize in any meaningful way like 30 or 40 years of community experience with this, but I've made a small selection that I think is very relevant to today's models, and especially the large language ones. And we'll be talking about problem scope, complexity, and the interpretation of results. So let's start with the problem scope. We can visualize the problem scope along a line, which goes from narrow to wide. By narrow, I mean well-defined, simple problems. By wide, I mean you might not even have one problem, or you might not have a well-defined problem. And you can be along this spectrum, and you have some influence on that. And what is it that we are trading off by going to the left or to the right? We're trading off model complexity, because narrow context and simple problems lend themselves well to simple pro models. And as you move towards wide definitions, you kind of have to add complexity to your model. So in the past, we always aimed for the narrowest scope because that meant we could use simpler models. And we always matched the model to the problem context. We never picked a model at random because that might be expensive or that might introduce problems you didn't want to have in the first place. But what is it exactly that makes us prefer simplicity in our models? Well, let's start trade-offs in complexity. So if we visualize complexity again on a line, and you can see the theme of this talk, right? They're all going to be like this. If you visualize them along the line, you can go from simple to complex. And what is it that we are trading off exactly? Well, first and foremost, I think we are trading off our ability to understand the model and the model results. It's the interpretability of the model. Do we understand how it behaves? We might not. 
And as we move towards complex, we lose that ability, but we gain accuracy. These complex models might better approximate reality than the simpler ones. But, well, it's not the only thing we are trading off, sadly, because we are also trading off transposability against accuracy. And this warrants some explanation, because simpler models, they might not be as accurate, but when you move them from one context to another, they might outperform your complex models. We've seen that happen often, because models are trained for specific use cases. When they are complex, they start to exhibit overfitting. They work very well for A, but then when you put them to B, they might just fail outright. So this is also something you're weighing up. And again, we are aiming for the simplest model that will solve our problem, that solves our problem scope. Now, the final thing I'd like to zoom in on is the interpretability, because why is it that we prefer understanding? Well, if we again visualize that along a spectrum, you'll find that we are trading off the way the model fails, because simple models are understandable. We know what kind of errors they exhibit. Yes, they are simplifications of reality. They fail. They are not 100% accurate. But quite often, we know how and in what way. So experts can compensate for that. As you move towards accuracy and you move away from interpretation, you get unknown errors. You know it's not perfect, but you lose the ability to understand why exactly it isn't perfect and in what way. And this brings me to the next point. Because when you understand the model, validating it is so much easier, generating trust in it also, because you can explain the model. People can understand. They trust that you know in what way it will fail. When you move towards accuracy at the cost of interpretability, you have to validate the model through use, because people cannot assume that it's correct, right? They don't understand how it works, so you need to show them and you need to prove it. So we always preferred interpretable models, and we had the luxury, because the problems we are solving lended themselves to models that were simple enough to have this. And these model results always came with expert opinion, because these experts understood in what way the model failed. Now, as you have been listening to this, you might have been thinking, but this is no longer how it works, right? We don't live in this era. Our models are not understandable. And yes, a lot has changed. So let's take a look at that and how the past relates to the present. So in a way, everything has changed. And let's start by listing our trade-offs again. And now remember how we said that we want to stay to the left of these, right? Tell me, where are we nowadays? At what side are we? It's, it's not a complicated question, right? We are to the right. We are firmly on the right. And this has consequences. You don't get free lunch. Instead of having narrow defined problems with simple models that we can understand, we are solving general purpose issues with complex models that seem accurate, but we don't necessarily know when they fail because they can hallucinate. But don't misunderstand. That's not a bad thing per se. It's something you need to be aware of, but it doesn't have to block you. Because the reason we are to the right is because we have to. The problems can no longer be solved by simple models of the past. We had to go this way because we had to work, at, work it out one way or another. And this is what we arrived at. And in this corner, you can still make the same trade-offs. You have a lot of models to choose from. Some of them are simpler, others are more complex. And they behave in a similar way. The simpler models are better understood. So the same trade-offs are still made. But we have our work cut out for us because this has consequences. These models require continuous guardrails. They require curation. And they have to be validated through use. We have to prove it, because in a sense, we removed one of the fundamental sources of trust we had, which was understanding how the model behaves. So we have to make up for that. And we have to restore confidence in these models through use. So that brings me already to the end. In a way, what I've talked about is that classical modelers, we faced many trade-offs, and we had a lot to choose from. And on these spectral, we always preferred interpretability of our models, simplicity, and trying to narrow down our problem scopes. We are no longer in the same ballpark. We cannot do the same things. It has all shifted to the right. 
So you can still make some trade-offs, but they will no longer be the same. And this has consequences for all of us. And I'm very happy that this need to build trust is also understood by Amazon. Because the announcements of today also included announcements about guardrails, about validation, about use. So this is really a hot topic that we will have to work on. And as engineers, it's our responsibility to make sure that happens. Because we are responsible for the models that we put out into the world. Thank you very much.